Chapter 10. Betrayed. The Britons soon discovered that the Romans had retreated, but made no movement in pursuit. They knew that the legionaries once in open ground were more than their match, and they were well content with the success they had gained. They had lost in all but 400 men while they were certain that the Romans had suffered much more heavily and that there was but little chance of the attack being renewed in the same manner. For if their progress was so slow when they had frost to aid them, what chance would they have when there was a scarce a foot of land that could bear their weight? The winter passed indeed without any further movement. The Britons suffered to some extent from the damps, but as the whole country was undrained and for the most part covered with forest, they were accustomed to a damp, laden atmosphere, and so supported the fogs of the fens far better than they would otherwise have done. In the spring, grain, which had been carefully preserved for the purpose, was sown in many places where the land was above the level of the swamps. A number of large boats had been built during the winter, as Beric and Aska were convinced that the next attack would be made by water. Having learned from the country people to the west that a vast number of flat bottom boats had been built by the Romans. Early in the spring, fighting again began. A great flotilla of boats descended from Huntingdon and turning off the side channels entered the swamp. But the Britons were prepared. They were now well provided with tools and numbers of trees had been felled across the channels completely blocking the passage. As soon as the boat left the main river, they were assailed with a storm of javelins from the bushes, and the Romans, when they attempted to land, found their movements impeded by the deep swamp in which they often sank up to the waist, while their foes in their swamp patterns traversed them easily and inflicted heavy losses upon them, driving them back into their boats again. At the points where the channels were obstructed, desperate struggles took place. The Romans from their boats in vain endeavored under the storm of missiles from their invisible foes to remove the obstacles, and as soon as they landed to attempt to do so, they were attacked with such fury that they were forced to fall back. Several times they found their way of retreat blocked by boats, that had come down through side channels and had to fight their way back with great loss and difficulty. After maintaining the struggle for four days and suffering a loss even greater than that they had incurred in their first attack, the Romans again drew off and ascended the river. The Fenmen had joined the Iceni in repelling the attack. The portion of the swamp they inhabited was not far away, and they felt that they too were threatened by the Roman advance. They had therefore rejoined the Iceni, although for some time they had kept themselves aloof from them, owing to quarrels that had arisen because, as they asserted, some of the Iceni had entered their district and carried off the birds from their traps. Beric had done all in his power to allay this feeling, recompensing them for the losses they declared they had suffered and bestowing many presents upon them. He and Aska often talked the matter over and agreed that their greatest danger was from the Fenmen. They view us as intruders in their country, Aska said, and doubtless consider that in time we shall become their masters. Should they turn against us, they could lead the Romans direct to our islands, and if these were lost, all would be lost. If you fear that, Aska, Budoic, who was present, said, we had better kill the little wrenches at once. No, no, Budoic, Beric said, we have nothing against them at present, and we should be undeserving of the protection of the gods were we to act towards them as the Romans act towards us. Moreover, such an attempt would only bring about what we fear. Some of them, knowing their way, as they do through the marshes, would be sure to make their escape, and these would bring the Romans down upon us. Even did we slay all this tribe here, the Fenmen in the north would seek to avenge their kinsmen and would invite the Romans to their aid. No, we must speak the Fenmen fair, avoid all causes of quarrel, do all we can to win their goodwill, and show them that they have nothing to fear from us. 
Still, we must always be on guard against treachery. Night and day, a watch must be set at the mouths of all the channels by which they might penetrate in this direction. Another month passed. The Romans remained in their forts round the fens. The natives had now been brought round to the western side, and under the protection of strong bodies of soldiers were occupied in clearing the swamp on that side. They made but little progress, however, for the Britons made frequent eruptions among them, and the depth of the morasses in this direction rendered it well nigh impossible for them to advance, and progress could only be made by binding the bush into bundles and forming roads as they went on. From their kinsmen in the northwest, Beric learned that a new propator had arrived to replace Suetonius, for it was reported that the wholesale severity of the latter was greatly disproved of in Rome so that his successor had come out with orders to pursue a milder policy and to desist from the work of extirpation that Suetonius was carrying on. It was known that at any rate the newcomer had issued a proclamation saying that Rome wished neither to destroy nor enslave the people of Britain and that all fugitives were invited to return to their homes, adding a promise that no molestation should be offered to them, and that an amnesty was granted to all for their share in the late troubles. What do you think, Aska? Beric asked when they heard the news. It may be true, or it may not, Aska said. For myself, after the treatment of Boadicea and the seizure of all her husband's property, I have no faith in Roman promises. However, all this is but a rumor. It will be time enough to consider it when they send in a flag of truce and offer us terms of surrender. Besides, supposing the proclamation has been rightly reported, the amnesty is promised only for the past troubles. The new general must have heard of the heavy losses we inflicted on the Romans as soon as he landed, and had he meant his proclamation to apply to us, he would have said so. However, I sincerely trust that it is true even if we are not included and are to be hunted down like wild beasts rome cannot wish to conquer a desert and you have told me she generally treats the natives of her conquered provinces well after all resistance has ceased it may well be that the romans disapprove of the harshness of suetonius although the rising was not due to him so much as to the villain Desiarius. Still he was harsh in the extreme, and his massacre of the Druids enlisted every Briton against him. Other measures may now be tried. The ground must be cultivated, or it is useless to roam. There are at present many tribes still unsubdued, and were men like Suetonius and Dacianus to continue to scourge the land by their cruelties, they might provoke another rising as formidable as ours and bring fresh disaster upon rome but whether the amnesty applies to us or not i shall be glad to hear that suetonius has left we know that three days ago at any rate he was at their camp opposite huntingdon and he may well wish to strike a blow before he leaves in order that he may return with the credit of having crushed out the last resistance Two nights later, an hour before daybreak, a man covered with wounds, breathless and exhausted, made his way up to the entrenchment on the principal island. To arms, he shouted, the Romans are upon us. One of the sentries ran with the news to Beric's hut. Springing from his couch, Beric sounded his horn, and the band, who were at all times kept to the strength of four hundred, rushed to the line of defenses. What is it? What is your news? Beric asked the messenger. It is treachery, Beric. With two comrades, I was on watch at the point where the principal channel hence runs into the river. Suddenly we thought we heard the sound of oars on the river above us. We cannot be sure. It was a faint, confused sound, and we stood at the edge of the bank listening, when suddenly from behind us sprang out a dozen men, and before we had time to draw a sword, we were cut down. They hewed at us till they thought us dead, and for a time I knew nothing more. 
When I came to myself, I saw a procession of Roman boats turning in at the channel. For a time I was too faint to move, but at last I crawled down a yard or two to the water and had a drink. Then my strength gradually returned and I struggled to my feet. To proceed by land through the marshes at night was impossible, but I found my coracle, which we had hidden under the bushes, and pulled up the channel after the Romans, who were now some distances ahead. The danger gave me strength, and I gained upon them. When I can hear their odds ahead, I turned off by a cross channel so as to strike another leading direct hither. What was my horror when I reached it to see another flotilla of Roman boats passing along? Then I guessed that not only we, but the watches at all the other channels must have been surprised and killed by the treacherous Fenmen. I followed the boats till I reached the spot where I knew there was a track through the marshes to the island. For hours I struggled on, often losing the path in the darkness and falling into swamps, where I was nearly overwhelmed. But at last I approached the island. The Romans were already near. I tried each avenue by which our boats approached, but all were held by them. But at last I made my way through by one of the deepest marshes, where at any other time I would not have set foot, even in broad daylight, and so I have arrived in time to warn you. You have done well. Your warning comes not, I fear, in time to save us, but it will enable us at least to die like men with arms in our hands. Parties of men were at once sent down to hold the entrenchments erected to cover the approaches. Some of those who knew the swamps best were sent out singly, but they found the Romans everywhere. They had formed a complete circle around the island, all the channels being occupied by the boats, while parties had been landed upon planks thrown across the soft ground between the channels to prevent any from passing on foot. They will not attack until broad daylight, Aska said, when all the men who had been sent out had returned with a similar tale. They must fight under the disadvantage of not knowing the ground and would fear that in the darkness some of us would slip away. Contrary to expectation, the next day passed without any movement by the Romans, and Beric and Aska agreed that most likely the greater portion of the boats had gone back to bring up more troops. They will not risk another defeat, Aska said, and they must be sure that, hemmed in as we are, we shall fight to the last. The practicability of throwing the whole force against the Romans at one point and of so forcing their way through was discussed. But in that case, the women and children, over a thousand in number, must be left behind, and the idea was therefore abandoned. Another day of suspense passed. During the evening, loud shouts were heard in the swamp, and the Britons had no doubt that the boats had returned with reinforcements. There were three points where boats could come up to the shore of the island. Aska, Bodoic, and another chief, each with a hundred men, took their posts in the entrenchments there, while Beric, with a hundred of the Sarsi, remained in the great entrenchment on the summit, in readiness to bear down upon any point where aid was required. Soon after daybreak, next morning, the battle began the Romans advancing in their flat bottom boats and springing on shore. In spite of a hail of missiles, they advanced against the entrenchments, but these were strongly built in imitation of the Roman works, having a steep bank of earth surmounted by a solid palisade breast high and constructed of massive timber. For some hours the conflict raged. Fifty of the defenders at each entrenchment thrusting down with their long spears the assailants as they strove to scale the bank, when the other fifty rained arrows and javelins upon them, and whenever they succeeded in getting up to the palisade through the circle of spears, threw down their bows and opposed them sword in hand. Again and again the Romans were repulsed with great slaughter. The cries of exultation from the women who lined the upper entrenchment rode loud and shrill. Beric divided his forces into three bodies. 
The first was to move down instantly if they saw the defenders of the lower entrenchments hard-pressed. The others were to hold their position until summoned by Beric to move down and join in the fray. He himself paced round and round the entrenchment, occupied less with the three desperate fights going on below than with the edge of the bushes between these points. He knew that the barasses were so deep that even an active and unarmed man could scarcely make his way through them, and that only by springing from bush to bush, but he feared that the Romans might form paths by throwing down faggots and so gain the island at some undefended point. Until noon he saw nothing to justify his anxiety. Everything seemed still in the swamp, but he knew that his silence was deceptive, and the canopy of marsh loving trees completely hid the bushes and the undergrowth from his sight it was just noon when a roman trumpet sounded and at once at six different points a line of roman soldiers issued from the bushes beric raised his horn to his lips and blew the signal for retreat at its sound the defenders of the three lower entrenchments instantly left their post and dashed at full speed up the hill, gaining it long before the Romans, who, as they issued out, formed up in order to repel any attack that might be made upon them. So they have made paths across the swamp, Aska said bitterly, as he joined Beric. They would never have made their way in by fair fighting. Well, Beric says, there is one more struggle, and a stout one, and then we go to join our friends, who have gone before us in the happy island in the far west. We need not be ashamed to meet them. They will welcome us as men who have struggled to the last for liberty against the oppressor, and who have nobly upheld the honor of the Iceni. We shall meet with a great welcome. Not until the Romans had landed, the whole of the force they had brought up, which Beric estimated as exceeding 2,000 men, did they advance to the attack pressing forward against all points of the entrenchments. The Iceni were too few for the proper defense of so long a circuit of entrenchments. But the women and boys took their places beside them, armed with hatchets, clubs, and knives. The struggle was for a long time uncertain. So desperately did the defenders fight, and it was not until suffering the loss of a third of their number from the missiles and weapons of the British that the Romans at last broke through the entrenchments. Even then, the British fought to the last. None thought of asking for quarter, but each died contented if he could kill but one Roman. The women flung themselves on the spears of the assailants, preferring death infinitely to falling into the hands of the Romans. And soon the only survivors of the Britons were a group of some 30 men gathered on a little knoll in the center of camp. Beric had successfully defended the chief entrance to the camp until the Romans burst in at other places, and then, blowing his horn, he had tried to rally his men in the center for a final stand. Aska had already fallen, pierced by a Roman javelin, but Bodoic and a small body of the Sarsi had rallied round Beric, and had for a time beaten off the assaults of the Romans, but soon they were reduced to half their number and were on the point of being overwhelmed by the crowds surrounding them when a Roman trumpet sounded and their assailants fell back. An officer made his way towards them and addressed Beric. Suetonius bids me say that he honors bravery and that your lives will be spared if you lay down your arms. Tell Suetonius that we scorn his mercy, Beric said, and will die as we have lived, free men. The Romans bade his men stand to their weapons and not move until his return. It was a few minutes before he came back again. Behind him were a number of soldiers who had laid aside their arms and provided themselves with billets of wood and long poles. Before Beric could understand what was intended, he and his companions were struck to the ground by the discharge of wooden missiles or knocked down by the poles. Then the Romans threw themselves upon them and bound them hand and foot. The camp was plundered, 
fire applied to the huts and the palisades beaten down then the captives were carried down to the boats and the romans rowed away through the marshes they had little to congratulate themselves upon they had captured the leader of the iceni had destroyed his stronghold and slain four hundred of his followers but it had cost them double that number of men and a large portion of the remainder bore wounds more or less severe Bodoak and the other prisoners were furious at their capture the britons had no fear whatever of death but capture was regarded as a disgrace and that they alone should have been preserved when their comrades had all been killed and the women and children massacred was to them a terrible misfortune they considered that they had been captured by an unworthy ruse for had they known what was intended they would have slain each other or stabbed themselves rather than become captives beric's feelings were more mixed although he would have preferred death to captivity his ideas had been modified by his residence among the romans and he saw nothing disgraceful in what he could not avoid he would never have surrendered would never have voluntarily accepted life but as he had been taken captive against his will and in a fair fight he saw no disgrace in it he wondered why he and his companions had been spared it might be that they were to be put to death publicly as a warning to their countrymen but he thought it more likely that suetonius had preserved them to carry them back to rome as a proof that he had before giving up the command crushed out the last resistance of the britons to roman rule as the captives had been distributed among the boats he had no opportunity of speaking to his companions until about midnight the flotilla arrived at godman castra then they were laid on the ground together a guard of six men taking post beside them Bodoic at once broke out in a torrent of execrations against the romans they had a right to kill us he said but they had no right to dishonor us we had a right to die with the others we fought them fairly and refused to surrender it is a shameful tyranny thus to disgrace us by making us captives i would not have refused death to my most hated foe but they shall not exult over us long if they will not give me a weapon with which to put an end to my life i will starve myself there was an exclamation of fierce assent from the other captives they have not meant to dishonor us Bedark, but to do us honor beric said the romans do not view these things in the same light that we do it is because in their opinion we are brave men who it was an honor to them to subdue that they have thus taken us you see they slew all others even the women and children we were captured not from pity not because they wished to inflict disgrace upon us but simply as trophies of their own valor just as they would take a standard we may deem ourselves aggrieved because we have not like the rest died fighting to the last and so departed for the happy island but it is the will of the gods that we should not make the journey for a time. It is really an honor to us that they have deemed us worthy of the trouble of capture instead of slaying us. Like you, I would rather a thousand times have died. But since the gods have decreed it otherwise, it is for us to show that not even captivity can break our spirit, but that we are able to bear ourselves as brave men who having done all that men could do against vastly superior force still preserve their own esteem and give way neither to unmanly repinings nor to a sullen struggle against fate nothing would please the romans better than for us to act like wild beasts caught in a snare gnashing our teeth vainly when we can no longer strike and either sulkily protesting against our lot or seeking to escape the pains of death or servitude by flying from life let us preserve a front haughty and unabashed we have inflicted heavy defeats upon rome and are proud of it let them see that the chains on our bodies have not bound our spirit and that though captives we still hold ourselves as free men fearless of what they can do to us 
in such a way we shall win at least their respect and they will say these are men whom we are proud of having overcome by the sacred oak beric you speak rightly Boduoc explained such was the bearing of caractus as i have heard when he fell into their hands and no one can say that caractus was dishonored no man can control his fate but as you say we may show that we are above fate what say you my friends has Beric spoken well? A murmur of hardly assent came from the other captives, and then the Roman sergeant of the guard, uneasy at this animated colloquy among the captives, gruffly ordered silence. Beric translated the order. Best sleep if we can, he added. We shall be stronger tomorrow. Few, however, slept, for all were suffering from wounds more or less severe. The following morning, their bonds were unloosed and their wounds carefully attended to by a leech. Then water and food were offered to them, and of these, following Beric's example, they partook heartily. An hour later they were placed in the center of a strong guard and then fell in with the troops who were formed up to escort Suetonius to Camalodian. What are they going to do to us, thank you, Budoic asked Beric. They are either going to put us to death publicly at Camalodian as a warning against resistance, or they are going to take us to Rome. I think the latter. Had Suetonius been going to remain here, he might be taking us for public execution. But as he has, as we have heard, been ordered home, he would not, I think, have troubled himself to have made us prisoners simply that his successor might benefit by the example of our execution. It is far more likely, I think, that he will carry us to Rome in order to show us as proof that he has, before leaving Britain, succeeded in crushing out all resistance here. And what will they do with us at Rome? That I know not, Bordeaux. Possibly they will put us to death there, but that is not their usual custom. Suetonius has gained no triumph. A terrible disaster has fallen upon the Romans during his command here, and though he may have avenged their defeat, he certainly does not return home in triumph. After a triumph, the chief of the captives is always put to death, sacrificed to their gods. But as this will be no triumph, we shall, I should say, be treated as ordinary prisoners of war. Some of these are sold as slaves, some employed on public works, of some they make gladiators. Men who fight and kill each other in the arena for the amusement of the people of Rome, who gather to see these struggles, just as we do when two warriors who have quarreled decide their differences by combat. The choice does not appear a pleasing one, Bedoic said, to be a private or public slave or to be killed for the amusement of the Romans. Well, the latter is the shortest way out of it, anyhow, and the one I should choose, but it must be terrible to have to fight with a man with whom one has no quarrel. Well, I don't know, Beric. If he is a captive like yourself, he must be just as tired of life as you are. So if he kills you, he is doing you a service. If you kill him, you are greatly obliged him. So looking at it in that way, it does not much matter which way it goes, for if you do him this service one day, someone else may do you a like good turn the next. I had not looked at it that way, Bodoic, Beric said laughing. Well, there is one thing I do not suppose. The choice will be given us. At any rate, I shall be glad to see Rome. I have always wished to do so, though I never thought that it would be as a captive. Still, it will be something, even in this evil that has befallen us, to see so great a city with all its wonders. Camelodium was but as a little hamlet beside it. On the evening of the second day after leaving Godman Castra, they arrived at Camelodian, which in the year that had passed since its destruction had already been partially rebuilt and settled by Gaulish traders from the mainland. Roman officials with their families and attendants, officers engaged in the civil service and the army, friends and associates of the procurator who had been sent out to succeed Catus Decinius, 
priests and servants of the temple. Suetonius had already sent to inform the new propator, Petronius Turpilanus, of the success which he had gained, and a crowd assembled as the procession was seen approaching. When all eyes were directed upon the little party of British captives who followed the chariot of Suetonius, many of the newcomers had as yet scarcely seen a native. So complete had been the destruction of the Trinobantes, and they looked with surprise and admiration at these men, towering a full head above their guards and carrying themselves in spite of their bonds with an air of fearless dignity. Most of all, they were surprised when they learned that the youth, for Beric was not yet but eighteen, who walked at their head, was the noted chief who had during the past year inflicted such heavy losses upon the troops of Rome, and who had now only been captured by treachery. And yet he lacked some inches of the height of his companions, but he bade fair in another two or three years to rival the dullest among them in strength and vigor. The procession halted before the building which had been erected from the ruins of the old city as a residence for the propraetor. Petronius, surrounded by a number of officials, came out to meet Suetonius. I congratulate you on your success, Suetonius, he said. It will make my task all the easier in carrying out my orders to deal mildly with their people, and it will make my return to Rome all the more pleasant, Petronius and I thank you again for having permitted me to continue in command of my troops until I had revenged the losses we have suffered at the hands of these barbarians. It is, of course, for you to decide upon the fate of Beric and his companions. Assuredly, they deserve death, but I should like to take them with me as captives to Rome. I should prefer you doing so, Suetonius. I could hardly pardon men who have so withstood us. But upon the other hand, I should grieve to commence my rule by an act of severity. Beside, I hope through them to persuade the others. For, as you told me in your letter, it is but a fraction of these outlaws that you have subdued to lay down their arms. It is well, indeed, that you have taken their chief and that he, as I hear, has partly been brought up among us and speaks our language. Yes, he lived here for some five years as a hostage for his tribe. He was under the charge of Caius Muro, who returned to Rome after our defeat of the Britons. I made inquiries about him when I learned that he was chief of the insurgents and heard that he was tractable and studious when among us, and that Caius thought very highly of his intelligence. They are noble-looking men, Petronius said, surveying the group of captives. It is an honor to conquer such men. I will speak with their chief presently. I shall make no longer delay, Suetonius said. Ships have been lying at the port in readiness for my departure for the last two weeks, and I would fain sail tomorrow or next day. Glad I shall be to leave this island, where I have had nothing but fighting and hardships since I landed, and you have done well. Petronius said courteously. It was but half conquered when you landed. It is wholly subdued now. It is for me only to gather the fruit of your victories. Never was there such an obstinate race, Suetonius replied angrily. Look at these men. They bear themselves as if they were the conquerors instead of conquered. They are good for something better than to be killed, Suetonius. If we could mate all our Roman women, with these fair giants, what a race we should raise. You would admire them less if you saw them pouring down on you, shouting like demons, Suetonius said sullenly. Perhaps so, Suetonius, but I will endeavor to utilize their strength in our service and not to call it into the field against us. Now let us enter the house, Varro, he said to one of his officers. Take charge of the captives until Suetonius sails. Guard them strongly, but treat them well. Place them in the house where they will not be stared at by the crowd. If their chief will give you his word that they will not attempt to escape, their bonds can be removed. If not, they must remain bound. Varro at once called the centurion of the legion in garrison at Camelodian and bade him bring up his company. 
These, on their arrival, surrounded the captives and marched with them to a guardhouse near. When they entered, Varro said to Beric, The orders of the propator are that you shall all be released from your bonds if you will give your oath that you will not try to escape. Beric turned to the others and asked if they were willing to give their promise. In no case could we escape, he said. You may be sure we shall be guarded too strictly for that. If it were better that we should remain bound by our own promise than by our fetters. As they all consented, Beric, in their name, took an oath that they would not attempt to escape so that the ropes that bound their arms were at once taken off and in a short time a meal was sent to them from the house of Petronius. Soon after they had finished, an officer came in and requested Beric to accompany him to the propraetor. I will bring two of my followers with me, Beric said. I would not say aught to the Roman governor that my tribesmen should not hear. The officer assented, and Beric with Bodoic and another sub-chief followed him to the house of the propraetor. Petronius was seated with Suetonius at his side, while a number of officers and officials stood behind him. How is it, Beric, he asked, that as I hear of you, you speak our language and have lived for years amongst us, come to be a leader of those who have warred against us? It is perhaps because I studied Roman books and learned how you value freedom and independence, Beric replied, and how you revolt against tyranny. Had Rome been conquered by a more powerful nation, every Roman would have risen in arms had one-tenth of the tyranny been practiced against them, which Cadius Decinius exercised against us. We have been treated worse than the beasts of the field. Our lives, our property, and the honor of our women were sacrificed at his will. Death was a thousand times better than such treatment." I read that Rome has elsewhere been a worthy conqueror, respecting the religion of the tribes it subdued, and treating them leniently and well. Had we been so treated, we should have been, if not contented, patient under our lot. But being men, we rose against the infamous treatment to which we were subject. And although we have been conquered and well-nigh exterminated, there are Britons still remaining and if such be the treatment to which they are subjected it is not till the last britain is exterminated that you will rule this island a murmur of surprise at the boldness with which the young captive spoke ran round the circle have you inquired since you arrived beric went on of the infamous deeds of decianus how he seized without the shadow of excuse the property of Brodicia, and how, when she came here for justice for herself and her insulted daughters, he ordered her to be scourged. Should we, a free-born people, submit to such an indignity to our queen? I knew from the first that our enterprise was hopeless, and that without order or discipline we must in the end be conquered. But it was better a thousand times to die than to live subject to treatment worse than that which you give to your slaves. I believe that there is justice in your complaints, Beric, Petronius said calmly, and it is to lessen these grievances that Rome has sent me hither. Vengeance has been fully taken for your rebellion. It is time that the sword was laid aside. I have already issued a proclamation granting an amnesty to all who then rose against us. Your case was different. You have still continued in arms and have resisted our power, but I trust that with your capture this will end. You and your companions will go to Rome with Suetonius, but there are many of your followers still in arms. With these I would treat, not as a conqueror or with the conquered, but as a soldier with brave foes. If they will lay down their arms, they shall share the amnesty and be free to return every man to his own land to dwell there and cultivate it free from all penalty or interruption their surrender would benefit not only themselves but all the britons so long as they stand in arms and defy our power we must rule the land with the sword 
but when they surrender there will be peace throughout the island and i trust that the britons in time will come to look upon us as friends if rome had so acted before beric said no troubles would have arisen and she might now be ruling over a contented people instead of over a desert there are still many of your tribesmen in the fens there is an army beric replied you have taken one stronghold and that by surprise but the lesson will not be lost upon them there will be no traitors to guide your next expedition by this time the last fenmen in the southern swamp will have been killed there will be a heavy vengeance taken by my countrymen i would fain put a stop to it all petronius said upon what terms think you would your countrymen surrender they will not surrender at all beric said there is not a man there but will die rather than yield but if you will solemnly take oath that those who leave the fens and return to their villages shall live unmolested save that they shall when their homes are rebuilt and their herds again grazing around them pay a tribute such as they are able to bear they will i believe gladly leave the fens and return to their villages and the fugitives who have fled north will also come back i am ready to take such an oath at the altar petronius said i have come to bring peace to the land i am ready to do all in my power to bring it about but how are they to know what i have done i will say petronius let us your captives be present when you take the oath release four of my band choose those most sorely wounded and who are the least able to support the journey to rome i will send them with my bracelets to the fens i will tell them what you have said and they will testify to having seen you swear before your gods and i will send my last injunctions to them to return again to their land to send for the fugitives to return from the north and to say from me that they will return as free men not as slaves and that there is no dishonor in accepting such terms as you offer i will do as you say the roman agreed so Atonius, you can spare four of your captives especially as there are assuredly some among them who could ill support the fatigues of the journey return now to your friends beric tomorrow morning you shall meet me at the temple and there i will take an oath of peace with britain chapter eleven a prisoner on leaving the propator beric further informed his comrades of the offer that petronius had made and you think he will keep his oath boduric asked i am sure of it beric said he had been sent out by rome to undo the mischief suetonius and dexenius have caused his face is an honest one and a roman would not lie to his gods any more than we would but you ought to have made terms with them beric boduric said you ought to have made a condition that you should be allowed to stay it matters not for us but you are the chief of all the iceni who are left in the first place boduoc i was not in a position to make terms seeing that i am a captive and at their mercy and in the next place i would not if i could think you that the tribesmen would then accept my counsels to leave the fens and return to their homes they would say that i have purchased my life and freedom from the romans and had agreed to betray them into their hands no one would venture to say that of you beric you may think not boduoc but if not now in the future it would be said that as before i was brought up among the romans so now i had gone back to them no even if they offered to all of us our liberty i would say let those go who will but i will remain a captive had the message come to us when i was free in the fens i would have accepted it for i knew that although we might struggle along we should be finally overpowered moreover the marsh fevers were as deadly as roman swords and though for a year we had supported them we should in time perhaps this year when the summer heats come have lost our strength and have melted away thus had i believed that the romans were sincere in their wish for peace and that they or desired to see the land tilled i would have accepted their terms 
because we were in arms and free and could still have resisted but as a captive and conquered i scorn to accept mercy from rome by this time they had arrived at the house where the other captives were guarded and beric repeated the terms that petronius had offered they will not benefit us he said we are the captives of suetonius and being taken with arms in our hands warring against rome we must pay the penalty but for the sake of our brethren i rejoice our land may yet be peopled again by the iceni and we shall have the consolation that whatever may befall us it is partly our valour that has won such terms from rome there are still fifteen hundred fighting men in the swamps and twice as many women and children there may be many more lurking in the fens to the north for great numbers especially our northern districts must have taken refuge with the brigantes thus then there will be when we have all returned be a goodly number and it is our defence of the fenlands that has won their freedom for them we may be captives and slaves but we are not disarmed for months we have held suetonius at bay and two romans have fallen for every briton and even at last it was by treachery we were captured none of us have begged our lives of rome we fought to the last showed front when we were but twenty against two thousand it was not our fault that we did not die on the field and we can hold our heads as high now when we are captives as we did when we were free men we know not what may be our fate at rome but whatever it be it will be a consolation to know that our people again wander in the old woods that our women are spinning by their hearthstones, that the Iceni are again a tribe, and that it is we who have won this for them. An enthusiastic assent greeted Beric's words. Now, he said, we must choose the four who shall carry the message. I said those most sorely wounded, but since four are to go, they can care little who are chosen. Most of us have lost those we love, but there are some whose wives may have been elsewhere when the attack was made, let them stay and let those who have no ties save that of the country go to rome only two men were found whose families had not been on the island when it was attacked these and the two most seriously wounded were at once chosen as the messengers the next morning the whole of the captives were escorted to the temple which was but a small building in comparison with the great edifice that had been destroyed at the capture of camelodion here petronius and all the principal officers and officials were assembled sacrifice was offered and then petronius laying his hand on the altar declared a solemn peace with the britons and swore that so long as they remained peaceable subjects of rome no man should interfere with them but all should be free to settle in their villages to till their land and to tend their herds free from any molestation whatever Beric translated the words of the oath to the Britons. Petronius then bade the four men who had been chosen stand forward and told them to carry his message to their countrymen. Enough blood has been shed on both sides, he said. It is time for peace. You have proved yourself worthy and valiant enemies. Let us now lay aside the sword and live together in friendship. I sent orders last night for the legions to leave their forts by the fenland and to return hither so that the way is now open to your own land we can settle the terms of the tribute hereafter but it shall not be onerous after leaving the temple berry gave his messages to the men and they at once started under an escort for the camp the officer in charge of them being ordered to provide them with a boat in which they were to proceed alone to their countrymen that evening petronius sent for beric and received him alone i am sorry he said that i cannot restore you and your companions to your tribe but in this i am powerless as suetonius has captured you and to him you belong i have begged him as a personal favour to hand you over to me but he has refused and placed as we are i can do no more i have however written to friends in rome concerning you 
and have said that you have done all in your power to bring about a pacification of the land and have begged them to represent to nero and the senate that if a report reach this island that you have been put to death it will undo the work of pacification and perhaps light up a fresh flame of war there had indeed been an angry dispute between suetonius and his successor the former although well pleased to return to rome was jealous of petronius and was angry in seeing that he was determined to govern britain upon principles the very reverse of those he himself had adopted moreover he regarded the possession of the captives as important and deemed that their appearance in his train as proofs that before leaving he had completely stamped out the insurrection would create a favorable impression and would go far to restore him to popular opinion this was as he had heard from friends in rome strongly adverse to him in consequence of the serious disasters and heavy losses which had befallen the roman arms during his propaeorship and he had therefore refused with some heat to grant the request of petronius the next morning the captives were mustered and were marched down to the river and placed on board a ship there were six vessels lying in readiness as suetonius was accompanied not only by his own household but by several officers and officials attached to him personally and by two hundred soldiers whose time of service had expired and who were to form his escort to rome to beric from his residence in camalodium large ships were no novelty but the britons with him were struck with astonishment at craft so vastly exceeding anything they had before seen could we sail in those ships to rome Boduoc asked you could do so but it would be a very long and stormy voyage passing through the straits between two mountains which the romans call the pillars of hercules our voyage will be but a short one if the wind is favorable we shall reach the coast of gaul in two days and thence we shall travel on foot fortunately the weather was fine and on the third day after setting sail they reached one of the northern ports of gaul when it was known that suetonius was on board he was received with much pomp and was lodged in the house of the roman magistrate as he had no desire to impress the inhabitants of the place the captives were left unbound and marched through the streets under a guard of the roman spearmen gaul had long been completely subdued but the inhabitants looked at the captives with pitying eyes when these reached the houses in which they were to be confined the natives brought them presents of food bribing the roman guards to allow them to deliver them as the language of the two people was almost identical the gauls had no difficulty in making themselves understood by the captives and asked many questions relating to the state of affairs in britain they had heard of the chief beric who had for a year successfully opposed the forces of rome and great was their surprise when they found that the youngest of the party was the noted leader two days later they started on their long march inured as the britons were to fatigue the daily journeys were nothing to them they found the country flourishing village occurred at frequent intervals and they passed through several large towns with temples handsome villas and other roman erections similar to those that they had sacked at the capture of camelodian the people here do not seem to suffer under the roman rule at any rate Boduoc remarked they appear to have adopted their roman dress and tongue but for all that they are slaves not slaves Boduoc, though they cannot be said to be free however they have become so accustomed to the roman dominion that doubtless they have ceased to fret under it they are indeed to all intents and purposes roman they furnish large bodies of troops to the roman armies and rise to positions of command and importance among them in time no doubt unless misfortune falls upon rome they will become as one people and such could no doubt in the far distance be the case with britain we shall adopt many of the roman customs and retain many of our own there is one advantage you see in roman dominion there are no more tribal wars no more massacres and slaughters each man possesses his land in peace and quiet 
but what do they do with themselves Boduoc asked puzzled in such a country as this there can be but few wild beasts if a man can neither fight nor hunt how are they to employ their time they must become a nation of women it would seem so to us Boduoc for we have had nothing else to employ our thoughts but when we look at what the romans have done how great an empire they have formed how wonderful are their arts how good their laws and what learning and wisdom they have stored up one sees that there are other things to live for and you see though the romans have learned all these things they can still fight if they once turn so much to the arts of peace as to forget the virtues of war their empire will fall to pieces more rapidly than it has been built up. But Doric shook his head. These things are well enough for you, Beric, but we have lived among the Romans and learned many of their ways. Give me a life in which a man is a man. When we can live in the open air, hunt the wolf and the bear, meet our enemies face to face, die as men should and go to the happy island without bothering our brains about such things as the arts and luxuries that the romans put such value on a bed on the fallen leaves under an oak tree with the stars shining through the leaves is better than the finest chamber in rome covered with paintings well Bedoic, beric said good-temperedly we are much more likely to sleep under the stars in Rome than in a grand apartment covered with paintings. But though the one may be very nice, as you say, in summer I could very well put up with the other when the snows lie deep and the north wind is howling. They did not, as Beric had hoped, cross the tremendous mountains, over which, as he had read in Polybius, Hannibal had led his troops against Rome. Hannibal had been his hero. His dauntless bravery, his wonderful resources, his cheerfulness under hardships, and the manner in which, cut off for years from all assistance from home, he had yet supported the struggle and held Rome at bay, had filled him with the greatest admiration, and unconsciously he had made the great Carthaginian his model. He was therefore much disappointed when he heard from the conversation of his guards that they were to traverse Gaul to Massalina and thence take ships to Rome. The Roman guards were fond of talking to their young captive. Their thoughts were all of Rome, from which they had been so long absent, and Beric was eager to learn every detail about the imperial city. The day's marches, therefore, passed pleasantly. At night they were still guarded, but they were otherwise allowed much liberty, and when they stopped for two or three days at a place, they were free to wander about as they chose. Their great stature, fair hair, and blue eyes exciting more and more surprise as they went further south, where the natives were much shorter and swarthier than those of northern Gaul. One of the young officers with Suetonius had taken a great fancy to Beric and frequently invited him to spend the evening with him at their haunting places. When they approach Massalinia, he said, I have some relations in the city, and I will obtain leave for you to stay with me at their house while we remain in the town, which may be for some little time, as we must wait for shipping. My uncle is a magistrate and a very learned man. He is engaged in writing a book upon the religions of the world, and he seldom remains long at any post. He has very powerful friends in Rome, and so is able to get transferred from one post to another. He has been in almost every province of the empire in order to learn from the people themselves, their religions and beliefs. I stayed with him for a month here two years ago on my way to Britain, and he was talking of getting himself transferred there after he had been among the Gauls for a year or two. But his wife was adverse to the idea, protesting that she had been dragged nearly all over the world by him, and was determined not to go to its furthest boundaries. But after the events of the last year, he has given up that idea. I know it will give him the greatest possible pleasure to converse with one who can tell him all about the religions and customs of the Britons in their own language. Massilia was by far the largest city 
that the Britons had entered, and they were greatly surprised at its magnitude and at the varieties of people who crowded its streets. Even Baduic, who professed a profound indifference for everything Roman, was stupefied when he saw a negro walking in the train of a Roman lady of rank. Is it a human being, think you, he murmured in Beric's ear, or a wild creature they have tamed? He has not hair, but his head is covered with wool like a black sheep. He is a man, Beric replied. Across the sea to the south there are brown men many shades darker than the people here, and beyond these like lands inhabited by black men. Look at him showing his teeth and the whites of his eye. He is as much surprised at our appearance, Bedoic, as we are at his. We shall see many like him in Rome, for Pollio tells me that they are held in high estimation as slaves, being good-tempered and obedient. He is hideous. Beric, look at his thick lips, but the creature looks good-tempered. I wonder that any woman could have such as one about the house. Can they talk? Oh, yes, they talk. They are men just the same as we are, except for their color. But what makes them so black, Beric? That is unknown, but it is supposed that the heat of the sun, for the country they inhabit is terribly hot, has in time darkened them. You see, as we have gone south, the people have got darker and darker. But are they born that color, Beric? Certainly they are. If a wife of mine bore me a child of that color, Bedoic said, I would strangle it. And think you that it is the heat of the sun that has curled up their hair so tightly? That I cannot say. They are all like that. Well, they are horrible, Bedoic said positively. I do not think that the earth contains such monsters. Soon after the captives were lodged in a prison, Polio came to see Beric and told him that he had obtained permission for him to lodge at his uncle's house, he himself being guaranteed for his safe custody there. Accordingly, they at once started together. The house was a large one, for, as Polio had told Beric by the way, his uncle was a man of great wealth, and it was a matter of constant complaint on the part of his wife that he did not settle down in Rome. Passing straight through the atrium, where he was respectfully greeted by the servants and slaves, Polio passed into the tablinium, where his uncle was sitting writing. This is the guest I told you that I should bring, uncle. He said he is a great chief, young as he looks, and has given us a world of trouble. He speaks Latin perfectly, and you will be able to learn from him all about the Britons, without troubling yourself and my aunt to make a journey to his country. Norbanus was an elderly man, short in figure, with a keen but kindly face. He greeted Beric cordially. Welcome, young chief, he said. I will try to make your stay here comfortable, and I shall be glad indeed to learn from you about your people, of whom, unfortunately, I have had no opportunity hitherto of learning anything save that when I journeyed up last year to the northwest of Gaul, I found the people calling themselves by the same name as you. They told me that they were a kindred race and that your religion was similar to theirs. That may well be, Beric said. We are Gauls, though it is long since we left that country and settled in Britain. It may well be that in some of the wars in the south of the island, a tribe finding themselves overpowered may have crossed the Gaul, with which country we were always in communication until it was conquered by you. We certainly did not come thence, for all of our traditions say that the Iceni came by ship from a land lying due east from us, and that we were in an offshoot of Belge, whose country lay to the northwest of Gaul. The people I speak of, the magistrate said, have vast temples constructed of used stones placed in circles, which appear to me to have, like the great pyramids of Egypt, an astronomical signification. For I found that the stones round the sacrificial altars were so placed that the sun at its rising threw its rays upon the stone only upon the longest day of summer. It is so with our great temples, Beric said, and upon that day sacrifices are offered. What the signification of the stones and their arrangement is, I cannot say. 
these mysteries are known only to the druids and they are strictly preserved from the knowledge of those outside the priestly rank spare him today uncle pollio said laughing we are like i hear to be a fortnight here before we sail so you will have abundant time to learn everything that barrett can tell you i will take him up now with your permission and introduce him to my aunt and cousins you will find them in the garden pollio supper will be served in half an hour tomorrow beric we will after breakfast renew this conversation that my feathered brain young nephew has cut so short my aunt lesbia would be greatly surprised when she sees you pollio laughed as they issued out into the garden i did not see her until after i had spoken to my uncle and i horrified her by telling her that the noticed British chief Beric, who had defeated our best troops several times with terrible slaughter, was coming here to remain under my charge until we sail for Rome. She was shocked, considering that you must be a monster of ferocity, and even my pretty cousins were terrified at the prospect. I had half a mind to get you to attire yourself in Roman fashion, but I thought that you would not consent. However, we shall surprise them sufficiently as it is. Lesbia was seated with her two daughters on couches placed under the shade of some trees. Two or three slave girls stood behind them with fans. A Dalmatian boar hound lay on the ground in front of them. Another slave girl was singing, accompanying herself on an instrument resembling a small harp while a negro stood near and readiest to start upon errands or to fetch anything that his mistress might for the moment fancy lesbia half rose from her reclining position when she saw pollio approaching accompanied by a tall figure with the hair of a golden colour clustering closely round his head the britons generally wore their hair flowing over their shoulders but the Iceni had found such inconvenience from this in making their way through the close thickets of the swamps that many of them, Beric among the number, had cut their hair close to the head. With him, it was but a recurrence to a former usage, as while living among the Romans, his hair had been cut short in their fashion. The two girls, who were fifteen and sixteen years old, uttered an exclamation of surprise as Beric came near and lesbia exclaimed angrily you have been jesting with us pollio you told me that you were going to bring beric the fierce britain chief here and this young giant is but a beardless lad pollio burst into a fit of laughter which was increased at the expressions of astonishment in lesbia's face when beric said in excellent latin pollio has not deceived you lady my name is beric I was the chief of the Britons, and my followers gave some trouble even to Soetonius. But you are not the barrack whom we have heard of as leading the insurgent Britons. There is no other chief of my name, Beric said. Therefore, if you heard aught of good or evil concerning Beric the Briton, it must be related to me. This is Beric, Aunt Pollio said, and you must not judge him by his looks. I was with Soetonius in his battles against him, and i can tell you that we held him in high respect as we had good cause for doing considering that in all it cost the lives of some twelve hundred legionaries before we could overcome him and we took him by treachery rather than force but how is that he speaks our language lesbia asked i was a hostage for five years among the romans beric said and any knowledge i may have of the art of war was learned from the pages of caesar polybius and other roman writers the romans taught me how to fight them and now pollio broke in i must introduce you in proper form this is my aunt lesbia as you see these are my cousins amelia and ennia do you know girls that these britons big and strong as they are are ruled by their women these take part in their councils and are queens and chieftainesses and when it is necessary they will fight as bravely as the men they are held by them in far higher respect than with us and i cannot say that they do not deserve it for they think of other things than attiring themselves and spending their time in visits and pleasure 
You are not complimentary, Pollio, Amelia said, and as to attire, the young Romans think as much of it as we do, and that without the same excuse, for we are cut off from public life and have none save home pursuits if you if you treat us as you say the britons treat their women i doubt not that we should show ourselves as worthy of it now i ask you fairly amelia can you fancy yourself encouraging the legionnaires in the heat of battle in sizing spears and shield and rushing down into the thick of the fight as i have seen the british women do no i cannot imagine that amelia said laughing i could not bear the weight of a shield and spear much less use them in battle. But if the British women are as much bigger and stronger than I am, as Barrack is bigger and stronger than you are, I can imagine their fighting. I wonder how the Britons could withstand our troops. But now that I see one of them, there is no difficulty in comprehending it. And yet you do not look fierce, Barrack. I do not think that I am fierce, Barrack said, smiling. But even the most peaceful animal will try and defend itself when it is attacked. Have you seen Norbanius? Lesbia asked. He has seen him, Polio replied, and if it had not been for me, he would be with him still. For my uncle wished to engage him at once in a discourse upon the religion and customs of his people. I carried Beric away almost forcibly. Lesbia sighed impatiently. The interest of her husband in these matters was to her a perpetual source of annoyance. It was owing to this that she so frequently traveled from one province to another instead of enjoying herself at the court in Rome. But although in all other matters Norbanus gave way to her wishes, in this he was immovable, and she was forced to pass a life in what she considered exile. She ceased to take any further interest in the conversation, but reclined languidly on her couch while Polio gave his cousin a description of his life in Britain, and Beric answered their numerous questions as to his people. Their conversation was interrupted by a slave announcing that supper was ready, and Lesbia was relieved at finding that Beric thoroughly understood Roman fashions and comported himself at table as any other guest would have done. The girls sat down at the meal, although this was contrary to usual custom, but Norbanus insisted that his family should take their meals with him, save upon occasion of a set banquet. It seems wonderful, Annie has said to her sister later on, that we should have been dining with the fierce chief of whom we have heard so much, and that he should be as courteous and pleasant and well-mannered as any young Roman. A good deal more pleasant than most of them, Amelia said, for he puts on no airs and is just like a merry, good-tempered lad, while if a young Roman had done but a tithe of the deeds he has, he would be insufferable. We must get Polio to take us tomorrow to see the other Britons. They must be giants indeed. When Beric, who says he is but little more than eighteen years, could take Polio on his arm and walk away with him. In the morning, accordingly, Polio started with his two cousins to the prison, while Beric sat down for a long talk with Norbanus in his study. Beric soon saw that the Roman viewed all the matters on which he spoke from the standpoint of a philosopher without prejudices. After listening to all that Beric could tell him about the religion of the Britons, he said, it is remarkable that all people appear to think that they have private deities of their own whose interest themselves specially on their behalf and aid them to fight their battles. I have found no exception to this rule, and the more primitive the people, the more obstinate is this belief. In Rome at present, the learned no longer believe in Jupiter and Mars, and the rest of the deities, though they still attend the state cemeteries at the temples, holding that a state religion is necessary. The lower class still believe, but then they cannot be said to reason. In Greece, skepticism is universal among the upper class, and the same may now be said of Egypt. Our Roman belief is the more unaccountable since we have simply borrowed the religion of the Greeks. The gods and their attributes being the same with only a change of name, and yet we fancy that those Greek gods are the special patrons of Rome. 
Your religion seems to be the most reasonable of any I have studied, and approaches more nearly than any other to the highest speculations of the Greek philosophers. You believe in one God who is invisible and impersonal, who pervades all nature, but having formed so lofty an idea of him, you belittle him by making him a special God of your own country, while if he pervades all nature, he must surely be universal. The Jews, too, believe in a single God, and in this respect they resemble you in their religion, which is far more reasonable than that of nations who worship a multiplicity of deities. But they, too, consider that their God confines his attention to simply to them, and rules over only the little tract they call their own, a province about a hundred miles long by thirty or forty wide. From them another religion has sprung, this has made many curvets, even in Rome, but has made no way whatever among the learned. Seeing that it is more strange and extravagant than any other, it has, however, the advantage that the new God is, they believe, universal, and has an equal interest in all people. I have naturally studied the tenets of this new sect, and they are singularly lofty and pure. They teach, among other things, that all men are equal in the sight of God, a doctrine which naturally gains for them the approval of slaves and the lower people, but upon the other hand brings them into disfavor with those in power. They are a peaceful sect and would harm no one, but as they preach that fighting is wrong, I fear that they will before long come into collision with the state, for were their doctrines to spread, there would soon be a lack of soldiers. To me it appears that their views are impracticable on this subject. In other respects, they would make good citizens, since their religion prescribes respect to the authorities and fair dealings in all respects with other men. They are, too, distinguished by charity and kindness towards each other. One peculiarity of this new religion is that, although springing up in Judea, it has made less progress among the Jews than elsewhere. But these people, who are of all others the most obstinate and intolerant, accused the founder of the religion, one Christus, before the Roman courts, and he was put to death, in my opinion most unjustly, seeing that there was no crime whatever alleged against him save that he perverted the religion of the Jews, which was in no way a concern of ours, as we are tolerant of the religion of all people. But Suetonius attacked our sacred island and slew the priests on the altar, Beric objected. That is quite true, Norbanus said, but he is, had nothing whatsoever to do with religion, but was simply because the priests stirred up insurrection against us. We have temples in Rome to the deities of almost every nation we have subdued, and have suffered without objection the preachers of this new doctrine to make converts. The persecutions that have already begun against the sect are not because they believe in the Christus, but because they refuse to perform the duties incumbent upon all Roman citizens. Two of my slaves belong to the sect. They know well that I care not to what religion they belong, and indeed, for my part, I should be glad to see all my slaves join them, for the moral teaching is high, and these slaves would not steal from me, however good the opportunity. That is more than I can say of the others. Doubtless, had I been fixed in Rome, the fact that they belonged to these people would have been kept a secret, but in the provinces no one troubles his head about such matters. These are, to my mind, matters of private opinion, and they have leave from me to go on their meeting days to the place where they assemble, for even here there are enough of them to form a gathering. So long as this is done quietly, it is an offense to no one. The matter was discussed the other day among us for orders against Christians came from Rome, but when the thing was spoken of, I said that, as I believe members of the sex were chiefly slaves who were not called upon to perform military duties, I could not deem that the order applied to them, and that as these were harmless people, and their religion taught them to discharge their duty in all matters save that of carrying arms, I could not see why they should be interfered with. 
Moreover, did we move in the matter? Did these people remain obstinate in their face? We might all of us lose some valuable slaves. After that, no more was said of the matter. Now tell me about your institution of the bards, of which I have heard. These men seem not only to be the depositors of your tradition and the reciters of the deeds of your forefathers, but to hold something of a sacred position intermediate between the Druids and the people. For some hours, Beric and his host conversed on these subjects. Beric learned more than he taught, and wondering much at the wide knowledge possessed by Norbanus. It was not until dinner was announced that the Roman rose. I thank you much, Beric, for what you have told me, and I marvel at the interest that you, who have for the last two years been leading men to battle, evince in these matters. After five minutes of such talk, my nephew Polio would begin to weary. I was fond of learning when I was in the household of Caius Muro, but my time was chiefly occupied by the study of military works and in military exercises. Still, I found time to read all the manuscripts in Moro's library, but I think I learned more from the talk of Sneas Nepo, his secretary, who was my instructor, than from the books, for he had traveled much with Moro and had studied Greek literature. Polio had returned some time before with his cousins. I would have come in before to carry you away, he whispered to Beric, as they proceeded to the dinner table, but it would have put out my uncle terribly and as i knew you would have to go through it all i thought it as well that you should finish with it at once i'm glad you did not beric replied it has been a great pleasure to me to listen to your uncle's conversations from which i have learned a great deal polio glanced up to see if beric was joking seeing that he spoke in perfect good faith he said Truly, Beric, you Britons are strange fellows. I'd rather go through another day fighting in your swamps than have to listen to Uncle for a whole morning. As they sat down, he went on. The girls are delighted with your Britons, Beric. They declare they are not only the biggest but the handsomest men they ever saw, and I believe that if your Lieutenant Boudoic had asked either of them to return with him and share his hut in the swamps, they would have jumped at the offer. The girls both laughed. But they are wonderful, Beric, Amelia said. When you told us that you were not yet full ground, I thought you were jesting. But I see now that you're truly these men are bigger even than you are. I wish I had such golden hair as most of them have, and such a white skin. Golden hair is fashionable in Rome, you know. It is scarce, except for those few whose mothers were Gauls, who have married with Romans. It is the nature of man to admire the opposite to himself, Norbanus said. You admire the Britons because they are fair, while to them, doubtless, Roman women would appear beautiful because their hair and their eyes are dark. But Beric had not said so, Father, Amelia said, laughing. I am not accustomed to pay compliments, Beric said with a smile, but assuredly your father is right. I have been accustomed for the last two years to see British maidens only. These are fair and tall, some of them well nigh as tall as I, and as they live a life of active exercise, they are healthy and strong. That they are, Polio broke in. I would as soon meet a soldier of the Goths and one of these maidens, Beric speaks of, when her blood is up. I have seen our soldiers shrink from their attack when, with flashing eyes, and hair streaming behind them, they rushed down upon us, armed with only stones and billets of wood that they had snatched up. What they may be in their gentlest moments, I know not, and I should hesitate to pay my court to one, for if she liked it not, she would surely make small difficulty in throwing me outside the door of a hut. You are too quick, Polio, Emilio said. Beric was about to compare us with them. The comparison is difficult, Beric said, but you must not imagine our women as being always in the mood in which Polio has seen them. They were fighting not for their lives, but in order to be killed rather than fall into the hands of your soldiers. Ordinarily, they are gentle and kind. They seem to Polio to be giantesses, but they bear the same proportions to our height as you do to the height of the Roman men. 
I meant not to say aught against them, Pollio broke in hastily. I meant but to show my cousins how impossible it was for you to make any comparison between our women and you. All who know them speak well of the British women and admire their devotion to their husbands and children. Their virtue and bravery you might as well compare to Libyan lionesses with a Persian cat as the Briton women with these little cousins of mine. But the Persian cat, doubtless its lovable qualities, Beric said smiling, it is softer and gentler and better mannered than the lioness, though perhaps the lion might not think so. But truly your Roman ladies are beyond comparison with ours. Ours live a life of usefulness, discharging their duties as mistress of the household, intent upon no domestic cares, and yet interested as ourselves in all public affairs, and taking a share in their decision. Your ladies live a life of luxury. They are shielded from all trouble. They are like delicate plants by the side of strong saplings. No rough air is blown upon them. They are dainty with adornments gathered from the whole world, and nature and art have combined alike to make them beautiful. All of which means, Amelia Polio laughed, that in Beric's opinion, you are pretty to look at, but good for nothing else. I meant not that, Beric said eagerly, only that the things you are good for are not the things which British women are good for. You have no occasion to be good housewives, because you have slaves who order everything for you. But you excel in many things of which a British woman never so much as heard. There is the same difference that there is between a cultured Roman and one of my tribesmen. Human nature is the same everywhere, Norbana said. Fair or dark, great or small, it is modified by climate, by education, by custom, and by civilization. But at bottom it is identical. And now, Polio, I think you had better take Beric down to the port. The sight of the trade and shipping will be new to him. Chapter 12 School for Gladiators As the vessels carrying Suetonius, his suite, and captive sailed up the Tiber, it was met by a galley bearing the orders of the Senate that Suetonius was not to traverse the streets with an armed suite and captives in his train, but was to land as a private person, that the soldiers were to march to the barracks on the capital line, where they would receive their arrears of pay and be disbanded, and that the captives were to be handed over to a centurion, who with his company would be at the landing place to receive them. Polio took the news to Beric, who was on board the same ship, the rest of the captives being with the soldiers in the vessel which followed. I am rejoiced indeed, he said, for though I knew that the general would not receive a triumph, I feared that if he made a public entry, it was possible there might be a public eye cry for your life, which would be our custom have been forfeited had there been a triumph. I doubt not that the hand of Petronius is in this. His messages would have arrived here weeks ago, and it may be that letters dispatched as much as a month after we left have preceded us. Doubtless, he would have stated that his clemency had had the desired effect, and that all troubles were at an end, and he may probably have added that this was partially due to your influence, and warned them that were you put to death, it would have a deplorable effect upon your people, and might cause a renewal of trouble. Suetanius is furious, for he has hoped much from the effect of his entry, which captives in his train would have produced. He has powerful enemies here, scarce a noble family, but has lost a connection during the troubles in Britain, and Suetonius is, of course, blamed for it. You and I know that, although he has borne himself harshly towards the Britons, the rising was due to Catus rather than to him, but as Catus is a creature of Nero, that blame falls upon Suetonius. It was the deeds of Catus that caused the explosion, Beric said, but it would have come sooner or later. It was the long-grinding tyranny that had well-nigh maddened us, that drove Caractus first to take up arms, that raised the western tribes, made all feel that the Roman yoke was intolerable. 
the news of the massacre of the druids and the overflow of our altars converted the sullen discontent into a burning desire for revenge and the insult to bodacia was the signal rather than the cause of the rising it is to the rule of suetonius that it is due that hundreds of thousands of britons romans and their allies have perished the fault of suetonius pollio said was that he was too much of a soldier he thought of military glory and left all other matters save the leading of his troops in the hands of his civilians petronius is a general but he has distinguished himself more in civil men two generals have been sent out with him to lead the troops if necessary but he has been chosen as an administrator they should have sent him out ten years ago beric said and there then would have been no occasion for generals they were now approaching rome and beric's attention was entirely occupied by the magnificent scene before him and with the sight of the temples and palaces rising thickly upon the seven hills massilia had surprised them by its size and splendor but besides rome it was only a village rome would do well he said to pollio to bring the chiefs of every conquered country hither the sight would do more than twenty legions to convince them of the madness of any efforts to shake off the roman yoke i will see you to-morrow pollio said as they neared the landing place i shall see many of my friends to-day and get them to interest themselves in your behalf i will find out for you where caius moro is at present doubtless he too will do what he can for you seeing that you lived so long in his charge for beric had not mentioned to his friend aught of the manner in which he had saved moro's daughter at the sack of camelodian as soon as the centurion came on board pollio recommended beric to his care saying that he was the chief of the party of british captives and that during the journey he had formed a close friendship with him i shall not be in charge of him long the centurion said i have but to hand him over to the governor of the prison but i will tell him what you have said to me he must now go on board the other ship and join his companions for my orders are that they are not to be landed until after dark pollio nodded to beric this was another proof that it was determined the populace should not be excited in favor of suetonius by the passage of the captives through the streets beric rejoined his companions well Bedark, what do you think of rome i have been thinking how mad our enterprise was beric you told me about the greatness of rome and from the first predicted failure but i thought this was because you had been infected by your roman training i see now that you were right well and what do you think is going to be done with us it is evident there is going to be no public display of us Bedoic. suetonius is at present in disgrace and we shall be either sent into the school for gladiators or set to work at some of the palaces nero is building they may do what they like Bedoic said but i will not fight for their amusement they may train me if they like and send me into the arena but if they do i will not lift sword and i will bid my opponent slay me at once there was a murmur of assent from some of the others but another who said well i would rather die fighting anyway than work as a slave at roman palaces found a response from several the next day they were marched up to nero's palace surprised as they might be by the splendor of the streets they traversed and by the grandeur and magnificence of the palace they betrayed no sign whatever of their feelings but marched through the vast halls with their wealth of marble and adornment with calm and unmoved faces at last they reached the audience hall where the emperor was seated with a throng of courtiers behind him nero was five and twenty but looked older for his desolate habits already left their marks upon his features he had an air of good temper and a rough frankness of manner that had rendered him popular among the mass of the people whom he courted by every means in his power distributing with lavish hand the wealth he gained by confiscation and spoliation of the rich 
the britons bowed deeply before him and then stood upright and fearless by hercules the emperor said to the consular standing next to him but these are grand men no wonder suetonius had had such trouble in subduing them and this young man is their chief truly as petronius said in his letter he is but a lad you speak our language too he went on addressing beric i was brought up as a hostage among the romans he replied and was instructed in their language and literature then you should have known better than to rise against this young chief two years ago i was but a boy caesar beric replied scarce deemed old enough to fight much less to give an opinion in the presence of my elders i was well aware that the struggle must end in our defeat but when the chiefs of my nation decided for war i had aught to do but to go with them but how is it then that you came to command so many and became in time the leader of so large a band it was because i had studied your military books and knew that only by an irregular warfare could we hope to prolong our existence it was no longer an insurrection we were simply fugitives trying to sell our lives dearly if suetonius had offered us terms we would gladly have laid down our arms but as he simply strove to destroy us we had like animals brought to bay to fight for our own lives the moment petronius offered to allow my people to return to their homes and, and pay tribute to rome i advised them to submit so petronius tells me and he has said much to excuse your conduct i would i could enlist this band as my bodyguard nero said in a low voice turning to his consular but the praetorian gods are jealous of their privileges and none save a roman can be enrolled in their ranks it would be dangerous season the praetorians are well affected to your majesty and in these days when there are so many ambitious generals at the head of armies it would be unwise to anger them then we will send them to the schools to be trained send this lad with the four best of the others to scopus and divide the rest among the three other schools the romans have never seen such men as these in the arena we must not spoil it by matching them at present with men whose skill more than makes up for their want of strength two years in a school will make marvels of them the lad will want more than that before he gains his full rank and strength but he will some day turn out such a gladiator as rome has never seen and if after a time we can find no champion to withstand him we can match him against the lions i will myself get scopus orders concerning him so saying he waved his hand the gods closed around the captives and they were led away what is it all about beric boduoc asked we are to go to the school for gladiators beric said but as the emperor considers that you will all need two years training at the exercises before you will be fit to appear in the ring we shall have time to think matters over much may happen before that nero may be liked by the mass of the people but he is hated and feared as i hear by the upper classes he may be assassinated or overthrown before that i don't see that it will make much difference to us Bedoic grumbled i don't know that it would at any rate we have time before us we shall be well taken care of well fed and have plenty of exercise before now the gladiators have shaken rome to its centre what has happened once may happen again as they passed along the streets of rome the news that a party of fair-haired giants was being escorted under a guard spread rapidly and a crowd soon filled the streets windows opened and ladies looked curiously down at the procession beric marched at the head of his party who followed four abreast and their air of calmness and self-possession their proud bearing and the massive strength of their figures roused the admiration of the multitude who on learning from the guards that the captives were britons greeted them with shouts of approval so thick became the crowd before they reached their destination that the roman soldiers had difficulty in forcing their way through 
as they turned into the street in which stood the great school of Scopus, the crowd at once guessed the destination of the captives. By all the gods, one of the lookers-on said, these fellows will furnish us with grand sport in the arena. It is a shame to turn such grand-looking men into gladiators, a woman said. What would you like to pick a husband out among them, dame? The first speaker laughed. I would not mind. At any rate, I would prefer any of them to such an ill-looking scarecrow as you, she retorted. It is bad enough when they kill off some of those Gauls who are far too good for such work, but the best of them I have seen in the arena lack six inches, both in height and breadth of shoulder of these Britons. Ah, the man grumbled. That is always the way with women. They think of nothing but strength. Why shouldn't we? Men think of nothing but beauty. And so, amid a chorus of remarks, for the most part complimentary, the Britons strode along, surrounded by their escort, till they reached the entrance to the school of Scopus. The master, attracted by the noise in the street, was standing at the entrance. He was a broad-built man, but without an ounce of superfluous flesh, with muscles and sinews standing up in knots and ridges, and evidently possessed of extreme activity as well as strength. Nero has sent you five fresh scholars, Scopus. By Hercules, Scopus said, they are splendid barbarians. Whence come they? They are Britons. Ah, yes, Claudius brought back a few with him, but that was before I was here. I would say they were all a few years younger. They are in their prime now, and to make a man first class, one should begin with him young. This youngster here is just the age. I warrant me there will not be many who can hold their own against him when I have trained him. He is their chief, the centurion said, and speaks our language as well as you do. That is good. I can speak a little Gaulish, but there is always trouble with newcomers from out-of-the-way countries when we have no one who speaks their language. Well, I will leave them with you. They are in your charge. I have the other fifteen to divide among the other schools. I will take care of them, Scopus said. There is good feeding and good drinking here, and no one runs away. There is nowhere to run to. That is one thing. Still, what could a man want more than to be well housed and well fed, and have the companionship of plenty of good fellows? Don't you think so? And he turned to Beric. It is of no use asking for more if one is not likely to get it. Certainly we might do worse. Well, follow me, Scopus said. I will introduce you to your comrades. Beric and his companions took a hearty farewell of the others, Beric telling them that doubtless they would have frequent occasions of meeting. He then followed Scopus into a large hall. Here some forty or fifty men were assembled. Some were swinging weights round their heads. Others were engaged at gymnastic exercises. Two men, under the direction of an instructor, were fighting with blunted swords. One great fellow, armed with a sword and shield, was hotly pursuing an active man a little over half his weight, carrying a trident in one hand and a net in the other, amid the laughter of a group watching them. At the entrance of Scopus and his companions, the proceedings were arrested. Here are some fresh hands, Scopus said, who have come to fill up the vacancies made in the games ten days since. They are Britons, and I should imagine will require a lot of training before they are fit for the arena. One of them talks Latin. The rest, I fancy, will have for the present to content themselves with the companionships of you Gauls, who are, as I believe, of kindred race, though it seems to me that either you must have fallen off in size, or they have increased since you separated. Some seven or eight Gauls stepped forward and addressed the Britons, and the latter, glad to find men who could speak their language, responded heartily. The gladiators were of many races. Beside the Gauls, there were four or five Goths, some Iberians, lean, swarthy men, Numidians, fleet of foot, lithe and active, 
these were used more often for contests with wild beasts than in the gladiatorial conflicts for which they lacked strength and weight parthians and scythians together with a score of natives of italy romans and others who have taken to the profession of gladiator as they might have done to any other calling now scopus said to beric you are free of the place there are no prisoners here there are regular hours and exercises but beyond that your time is your own to walk in the city to see the shows or to remain here as you see all here dress somewhat after roman fashion so that as they go abroad they may not be stared at there is no obligation that way but it is more comfortable there are upwards of a hundred schools in rome some are larger than mine some smaller but there is not one that stands higher when one of my men enters the ring the audience know that they are going to see a good sport do we have to fight against each other or against strangers against strangers scopus said when there is going to be a show day so many schools are warned to send three or four men as the case may be and the master of ceremony matches them against each other. Sometimes there may be ten couples, sometimes forty or fifty. It depends whether it is a great occasion or not. And, of course, each school hopes to see its champions win. That fellow you saw running with a net, he is a Scythian, and so quick and nimble that he always gets away and is ready for a throw again before his opponent can overtake him. He is a great favorite of the public, for he has been in the arena twelve times and has always conquered. What do you consider to be the best weapon, the trident or the sword? If a man is active without being strong, I should make a retarius of him, Scopus said. If he is strong without being active, he would naturally fight with sword and buckler. Then there is the castus, but the romans do not care for that though to my mind it is the finest of all the exercises for that both strength and activity are required but it is not bloody enough for the romans perhaps the thing that demands the greatest skill and nerve and strength at the same time is to fight with beasts however we settle none of these things at first after a few months training we see what a man's capabilities are and what himself has a fancy for. I always let a man choose, if he has any very strong wish in the matter, for he is sure to succeed best in that. There are many who, even with all my care, never turn out first class. These are reserved to fight in what may be called general contests, which have become popular lately, 10 against 10, or 50 against 50, on two on three grand occasions there have been as many as a thousand engaged. For these, no particular skill is required. It is one side against the other. Lastly, there are a few who turn out so useless that it would be a waste of pains to try to make anything of them. These are sent to the galleys or to the public works. You never find any unwilling to learn, Beric said. Not one, the man said callously. A man has to defend himself, and even with blunt swords, he will get awkward cracks if he cannot protect his head. Besides, in the arena, a man's life depends upon his skill, and the conquered is sure to have no mercy shown him unless he has borne himself well. Therefore, each man is anxious to learn. I have had a few obstinate fellows, for the most part Goths, who would do nothing. I simply send them down to the galleys, and I warrant me that they are not long in finding out what fools they have been and would give a good deal to exchange their beds of hard boards and their coarse food for a life of pressure and freedom here. As long as it lasts, Beric said. Yes, as long as it lasts. But with all its dangers, it is likely to last as long as that of a galley slave. What with bad food and hardships and toil and the taskmaster's whip, and the burning sun, a galley slave's life is a short one. 
while a skillful gladiator may live for many years and in time save money enough to set up a school as i have done were you a gladiator once beric asked certainly i was and so were all the masters of the schools except perhaps a few greeks whose methods differ from ours i was ten years in the arena and fought thirty-five battles in thirty i was victorious in the other five i was defeated but as i was a favorite and always made a good fight the thumbs were turned up which as you may know is a signal for mercy are you a roman no i am a thessalian i took to it young having got into trouble at home we have blood feuds there and having killed the chief of a house with which my people had a quarrel i had to fly and so made to pola thence i crossed to brundisium i worked there in the dockyard for a year or two but i was never fond of hard work of that sort so i came on here entered a school and now as you see i am master of one a gladiator who distinguishes himself gets many presents and i did well the life is not a bad one after all it must be hateful having to fight with men with whom you have no quarrel beric said you don't feel that after the first minute or two scopius laughed there is a man standing opposite to you with a sword or a trident and you know very well that if you do not kill him he is going to kill you it makes very little difference after you once face each other whether there was any quarrel between him and you beforehand or not the moment the fighting begins there is an end of all nonsense of that sort what is an enemy a man who wants to do you harm the man facing you is going to kill you unless you kill him there cannot be a worse enemy than that after all it is just the same with soldiers in a battle they have no particular quarrel with the men facing them but directly the arrows begin to fly and a storm of javelins come singing through the air you think of nothing but of trying to kill the men who are trying to kill you i thought as you do before i entered the arena for the first time but i never felt so afterwards all these things are matters of usage and the gladiator after his first combat enters the ring with just the same feeling as a soldier marches to meet an enemy beric was silent he had no doubt that there was some truth in what scopus said his own experience of battle had shown him this but he was still determined in his mind that come what would he would not fight for the amusement of the romans but it was of no use to say this now it might be a long time before he was required to enter the arena and until then he might as well apply himself to gaining strength and science and arms it did not seem to him that there was any possibility of escape but he might at least take to the woods stand at bay there and be killed in a fair open fight the next morning the exercises began they were at first of a moderate character and were only intended to strengthen the muscles and add to the endurance for the first six months they were told that their work would consist only in gymnastic exercises lifting weights wielding heavy clubs climbing ropes wrestling and running on foot their food was simple but plentiful all adopted the roman custom in order to avoid observation when they went abroad being a strong body and individually formidable they were free from the rough jokes generally played upon newcomers and when after six hours of exercise they sat down to a hearty dinner the general feeling among them was that things were better than they expected and the life of a gladiator with the exception of his appearances in the arena was by no means a bad one polio called in the afternoon as he had promised and had a long talk with beric in the first place i have some bad news for you beric caius muro remained here but a month after his return from britain and was then sent to command the legion in the north of syria that is bad news indeed polio i had looked forward to seeing him i have made sure that i should find one friend at least in rome it is unfortunate indeed beric for he would have spoken for you and might have obtained a better lot for you i hate seeing you here he said passionately but it is better than being executed at once which is the lot that generally befalls the chief of captives taking in war scopus is not a bad fellow when things go well but they say that he is a fiend when his blood is up 
He is one of the finest fighters we ever had in the arena, though he left it before I was old enough to go there. I knew him well, however, for I used to come here with my elder brother, who was killed four years ago in Africa. It is quite the fashion among the young Romans to go the round of the schools and see the gladiators practicing. And then when the sports come on, they bet on the men they consider the most skillful. A fine sport, Beric said sarcastically. Well, you see, Beric, we have been bred up to it, and we wager upon it just as you Britons do on your fights between cocks. I never felt any hesitation about it before, because I had no particularly personal interest in any of the combatants. After all, you know, life is dull in Rome for those who take no part in politics, who have no ambition to rise at the court, and who do not care overmuch for luxury. We have none of the hunting with which you harden your muscles and pass your time in Britain. Therefore, it is that the sports of the arena are so popular with our class as well as with that below it. You must remember, too, that the greater portion of the gladiators are captives taken in war and would have been put to death at once had they not been kept for this. I do not say that they have anything to complain of, Polio, but I am sure that most of them would much rather perish in battle than be killed in the arena. Yes, but it is not a question of being killed in battle, Beric. It is a question of being captured in battle and put to death afterwards. It may be the fashion some day or other to treat captives taken in war with generosity and honor, but it certainly is not so at present, either with us or with any other nation that I know of. I don't think that your people differ from the rest, for every soul who fell into their hands was slain. I quite admit that, Beric said, and should have no cause for complaint had I been slain as soon as I was captured. But there is something nobler in being killed as a victim of hate by a victorious enemy than to have to fight to the death as a holiday amusement. I admit that, Polio said, and though since Nero came to the throne there has been an increase in these gladiatorial displays, methinks there are fewer now than in the days before the empire, when Spartacus led 20,000 gladiators against Rome. There is one thing, if the creed of those Jews of whom Norbanus was speaking to you ever comes to be the dominant religion, there will be an end to the arena, for so averse are these people to fighting that when placed in the arena, they will not make even an effort to defend themselves. They do not, as do the Goths sometimes, lower their swords and fall on the points. Suicide they consider wrong and simply wait calmly like sheep to be killed. I have been talking with some friends over the persecutions of two years ago, just after I left for Britain, and they say it was wonderful to see the calmness with which the Christians meet death. They say the persecution was given up simply because the people became sick of spectacles in which there was no interest or excitement. Well, Beric, are you ready to go out with me? You will not be ashamed to walk through the streets with a gladiator, Polio. Ashamed? On the contrary, you must know that gladiators are in fashion at present, Beric. The emperor prides himself on his skill and consorts greatly with gladiators and has even himself fought in the arena, and therefore it is the thing with all who are about the court to affect the society of gladiators. But as yet you are not one of them, although you may have commenced your training for the arena. But fashion or not, it would have made no difference to me. You are my friend, whatever evil fortune may have done for you. The only difference is that whereas, had you not been in fashion, I should have taken you with me only to the houses of intimate friends, as I did at Massilia, now you will be welcome everywhere. Besides, Beric, even in Rome, a chief who has kept Suetonius at bay for a year and who is, moreover, a Latin scholar accustomed to Roman society, is recognized as being an object of great interest, especially when he is young and good-looking. I am glad to see that you have adopted clothes of our fashion. They set you off to a much better advantage than does the British garb, beside attracting less attention. I hope that you are not going to take me today to meet any people, Polio. I want to see the temples and public buildings. It shall be just as you wish, Beric. 
For hours Beric wandered about Rome with Pollio, so interested in all he saw that he was scarce conscious of the attention he himself had attracted. From time to time they met acquaintances of Pollio, who introduced them to Beric as my friend the chief of the Iceni, who cost us a year's hard work and some twelve hundred men before we captured him. Petronius has written so strongly to Nero in his favor that his life has been spared and he has been placed in the school of Scopus. And the languid young Roman, looking at Beric's height and proportions, no longer wondered at the trouble that the Roman legions had had in overcoming the resistance of a mere handful of barbarians. Beric, on his part, was by no means surprised at the appearance of these young courtiers. He had seen many of the same type at Camelodian, and had heard Caius lament the effeminacy of the rising generation, but he knew that these scented young nobles could, if necessary, buckle on armor and fight as valiantly as the roughest soldier, though why they should choose to waste their lives at present in idleness when there was so much work to be done in every corner of the vast empire was altogether beyond his comprehension. Why is there a crowd gathered around that large building, he asked Pollio. That is one of the public granaries. Corn is brought here in vast quantities from Sardinia and Sicily, from Spain and Africa, and since Nero came to the throne, it is distributed gratis to all who choose to apply for it. No wonder Nero is popular among the people. He feeds them and gives them shows. They want nothing more. It is nothing to them, the cruelties he exercises upon the rich. But it must encourage the people in lazy habits, Beric said. Polio shrugged his shoulder. They think because they are citizens of the capital of the world, they have a right to live in idleness, and that others should work for them. At any rate, it keeps them in good temper. There have been great tumults in Rome in past times. But by drawing the tribute in corn and distributing it freely here, Nero keeps them in a high state of contentment. You don't like Nero, Polio? I hate him, Polio said. He is a tyrant, greedy, cruel, and licentious. He had his own mother murdered because she opposed his plans, and some of our best and noblest citizens have been put to death either because Nero was jealous of their popularity or because he desired to grasp their possessions. It is horrible that Rome, which has conquered the world, should lie prostrate at the feet of a creature like this. It was because my father feared that some spy among the slaves might report what I said about Nero that caused him to send me out to Suetonius, who is a connection of our family, and he will ere long obtain for me some other employment away from the capital. I shall be glad to be gone. The atmosphere here seems to stifle one. Nero's spies are everywhere, and a man is afraid of speaking his thoughts even in his own house. I like to take life easy, but I would rather be battling with your people in the swamps than living in idleness in Rome. I thought you were glad to return, Polio. I thought I should be, Beric, but I suppose the act of light in Britain has spoiled me. I used to scent my hair and lounge in the baths and frequent the shows and lead just such a life as the young men we have spoken to this afternoon, and I was contented with it. I wondered at myself now, but I cannot take up the old life where I left it. I have been back for 24 hours, and I am restless already, and I am longing to be doing something. I should think, Beric said with a smile, that you might well put up with Rome for a few weeks. It seems to me that it will take years to know all its wonders. There are the great libraries, too, filled with manuscripts, and as you understand Greek, you could study the writings of the sages and philosophers. I would rather row in the galleys, Polio said. I don't mind an hour or two now and then with the historians, but the philosophers are too deep for my shallow brain. Would you like to look into a library now? Beric assented eagerly, and they entered one of these buildings. It consisted of a great hall with innumerable couches and benches for readers. Round the walls were pigeonholes in which the manuscripts were deposited. 
and numerous attendants moved to and fro among the readers, supplying them with such manuscripts as they desired, and taking away those they had done with. Leaving the hall, they passed through a series of large apartments in which hundreds of men were at work copying manuscripts. These are the scribes, Pollio said. Very many of them are slaves whom the owners allow to work here, sharing with them their earnings. Others are freedmen who have either purchased their liberty from their savings or have been manumitted by their owners. You see, many of the most popular writings, such as those of Caesar, Tacitus, Livy, or the poets Horace, Virgil, and Ovid, are constantly in demand, and scores of copies must be kept on hand. Then again, many of the Greek authors are greatly in request. The manuscripts wear out and must be replaced, so that at the various libraries there are some thousands of scribes always kept employed. You see among the scribes men of many nationalities, frequently disciplines of the sect. Can I come here and read? Beric asked eagerly. Certainly you can. These libraries are open to all. So are the baths, at least a greater portion of them. Everything is free here, but it is nearly time for us now to be going home. Beric availed himself at once of the advantages offered by the public library. It was only thus that men of moderate means could in those days obtain access to books, for the cost of manuscripts was considerable and libraries were only to be found in the houses of the wealthy. His taste for reading was a matter of astonishment among the gladiators, and was the subject of a good deal of jesting. This, however, was for the most part of a good-natured kind, but upon the part of one named Lupus it was sneering and offensive. This man, who was a professional gladiator, that is, one of those who was taken to it as a trade, was a Roman of unusual stature and strength. He had been a worker in iron, and from making arms took to their use. He had won many victories in the arena, and was considered the champion of the school of Scopus. The only man who approached him in the number of victories being Porus, the Scythian, whose strong point, however, lay in his activity and his dexterity in throwing the net rather than in strength. Lupus had, from the first day of the Britons' arrival at Ludus, viewed them with aversion, his hostility to Beric being especially marked, and he particularly objected to the slight deference shown to him by his companions. In spite of the protest of Beric himself, who in vain pointed out to them that he was now no longer their chief, and that they were in all respects comrades and equals, Lupus had carefully abstained from any remarks that would bring him into collision with the other Britons mortified as he was that his strength and stature of which he was very proud had been thrown into the shade by that of the newcomers he felt that in a quarrel their rough strength might render them more than his match beric however he considered as but a youth and though doubtless powerful deemed that his muscles would be no match for his own seasoned strength and yet he had not seen beric tried with any arms and thought that the young barbarian could know nothing of the management of weapons. At first, his annoyance only took the form of addressing him with an affected deference as my lord Beric. But the discovery that while he himself was unable to read or write, the young Briton was fond of study and spent his spare time in the public libraries afforded him opportunities for constant sneers. These Beric took in good part, but Balduoc, who had now picked up enough Latin to understand the gist of his remarks, one day intervened and sized Lupus by the shoulder and dashed him to the ground. The Roman sprang to his feet, caught up a knife from the table, and rushed at Bodoric. Scopus, however, who was present, with an angry growl, sprang upon him, sizing him by the throat with so vigorous a grasp that his face became purple, his eyes stared, and he in vain grasped for breath. Then he flung him down into a corner of the room with such force that he lay half stunned. You dog, he exclaimed, how dare you take a knife? I will have no quarrels here, as you know, and if you again venture on a disturbance, I will bid your comrades to tie you up and will flay the skin off your back 
with the lash. The Briton was perfectly right. Why can't you leave his friend alone? I have marked your ill nature jest before, and I'm glad that he punished you. Lupus rose slowly to his feet with an angry glare in his eyes. He knew, however, that Scopus had in his time been unrivaled in the arena, and that, moreover, the rest who had been offended by his airs of superiority would side with the Lannister against him. I said nothing to the Briton, he said. It was the boy I addressed. If it was an offense, why did he not take it up? Is he a coward that the others have to fight his battles? Is he offended? Why does he not challenge me to fight at his customary in all the ludi? Because he is yet but a pupil and will not be fit to enter the arena for three or four years, Scopus said. A fight can only be between trained gladiators. You don't suppose that a fresh joined youth is going to fight with one who has won a score of times in the arena? Excuse me, Scopus, Beric said quietly. I am perfectly ready to fight with this braggadocio and challenge him to a contest. A few hard knocks will do neither of us any harm. Therefore, let us go into the school and have it out. It is much better so than to have perpetual quarreling. Scopus would have objected, but the gladiators broke into a shout of a fight, a fight. And as it was, according to the rules of all the ludi, that quarrels should be fought out with wooden swords without interference by the Leneste, he simply shrugged his shoulders. Well, as he has challenged you, Lupus, I have nothing to say to it and the whole of those present at once had joined to the school. The combatants were armed with bucklers and with swords of the same weight to those ordinarily used, but with square edges with the corners rounded off so that though they would give a heavy blow, they would not cut. Lupus, confident in his skill and furious at the humiliation he had just suffered, at once sprang upon Beric, but the latter as nimbly leaped back, catching the blow on his buckler, and at the same time bringing his own with such force and weight upon the Roman's left shoulder that it brought him for a moment on his knee. A shout of astonishment and applause burst from the lookers on. Lupus would have instantly renewed the fight, but Beric stepped back and lowered his sword. Our left arm is disabled, he said. You had best wait till you can use your buckler again. It would not be a fair match now. Furious as he was, Lupus felt the truth of what his opponent said, and though the burst of applause at Beric's magnanimity angered him even more than before, he drew back a step or two. At the order of Scopus, two of the others came forward with some oil, with which for some minutes they kneaded the shoulder. I am ready again, he said at last, and the gladiators drew back, and the opponents faced each other. Lupus had learned that Beric was not as he had supposed entirely untaught, but although he had attributed the blow he had received solely to his own rashness, he renewed the conflict with the same care and prudence he would have shown had he been fighting with edged weapons in the arena. He soon found, however, that he had met with an opponent differing widely from those he had hitherto fought. Beric had had excellent teachers among the veteran legionaries of Camelodium, and to skill in the sword he added a prodigious activity. Instead of fighting in the ordinary Roman method, standing firm with the body bent forward and the buckler stretched out at the level of the shoulders in front of him, he stood slightly poised on his feet, ready to spring forward or back, and with his shield across his body. In vain, Lupus tried to get close quarters. His cramped attitude prevented rapid movement, and he could not get even within striking distance of his opponent, save when the latter sprang in to deliver a blow. These, however, fell vainly, for Lupus was fighting now calmly and warily, and with sword or shield guarded every blow aimed at him. Beric soon felt that he should but exhaust himself that he continued to attack in this fashion, and presently desisted, and standing his ground awaited the attack of Lupus, the blows fell fast and heavy now. Then Beric purposely lowered his buckler a moment. Lupus instantly struck, springing a pace forward. Beric sharply threw up his left arm, 
striking up the hand of lupus as it fell and at the same moment brought this weapon with tremendous force down upon the head of his antagonist who fell as if he was killed habet habet shouted the gladiators alike exalted and astonished at the defeat of the bully of the school by the gods beric scopus said you have given him a lesson i talked about four years training but even now i would send you in the arena without fear why there are but one or two gladiators who are considered the superior of lupus with the sword and he had from the first no chance with you it was simply because he did not understand my way of fighting beric said quietly no scopus i will have the four years training before i fight i have chanced to overcome lupus this time but i am not going to match myself against men until i have my full strength scopus laughed that looks as if there were strength enough in your arm beric he said pointing to the prostrate figure however i know from what you have said that you wish to put off your entry into the arena as long as possible and doubtless practice and teaching will render you a far better swordsman than you are now take him away he said to the others pointing to lupus dash cold water over him till he comes round then bandage his head i doubt if his skull be not broken one of you had better go for a leech to examine him and mine let not a word be breathed outside the school as to this contest we will keep it silent until it is time for beric to enter the arena and then we shall be dull indeed if we do not lay bets enough on him to keep us in wine for a year there is no fear of lupus himself saying a word about it you may be sure that roughly shaken as his conceit may be he will hold his tongue as to the fact that he has found his master in what he was pleased to call a boy mind if i ever hear a word spoken outside the school on the subject i will make it my business to find out who spread the report and it will be very bad for the man who did it when i bring it home to him it was upwards of a week before lupus was able to enter the gymnasium again beric had particularly requested the others to make no allusion to his discomfiture but from that time the superiority of lupus was gone and beric's position in the school was fully established